So I think we are at the at the mark of five minutes. So it's a pleasure to have Kathy Wu to give a guest lecture. So I guess this is the second guest lecture in our course. So Kathy is a professor in LIBS. And you know, her research has spanned multiple things involving, you know, user reinforcement learning with self-driving cars to user reinforcement learning in societal systems and so on. So today, Kathy is going to talk about applications of RL. And I'm very excited to hear more about this. And to everyone on the call, you know, I would encourage you to switch on your video and interact with Kathy. I think that would be great. You know, it's always good to see faces instead of seeing black screens. So Kathy, just to mention one more thing in the course, I have noticed that many people, you know, put questions in the chat. So I am happy to monitor that. Or I don't know, do you want to, I mean, do you want me to monitor that or do you want to have a look yourself? I can do either way. Uh, why don't we do this? Uh, if I don't seem to be responding to the questions, you'll know I missed them. Okay, <laughs> and then you can jump sure. in. Okay. Yeah, so how I usually do this, though, I mean, feel free to include questions in the chat, uh, but also feel free to just speak up. Uh, this looks like it'll be uh, like a, a cozy group. So uh, feel free to interrupt. You can raise your hand. Uh, I am pretty good at seeing hands raised. So, uh, so feel free to interact in any way you uh, feel is best. Well, thanks, Tolkien, for the invitation. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, generally the topic of applications of RL. Uh, but the real question we're trying to answer is, what exactly makes a problem suitable for RL today? OK, so um, maybe let's start with throwing that question to all of you. What do you think makes a problem suitable for RL today? What properties of a problem? What characteristics of a problem? You can give applications as well. Fundamentally, would you say sequence of decisions and sporadic rewards? Sequence of uh, decisions and sporadic rewards? Yeah. And also when the um, planning, planning is not easy for um, high dimensional problems, I guess. Planning for high dimensional problems? Uh, when that's not easy to do. Uh, and by that, you mean that is when RL is suitable? Right, right. Cool. I mean, feel free to also write on the chat. You know, some of you want to, you know, just put comments on the chat. Yeah, feel free to interact however you want. Or maybe you can just tell your favorite added example so far, you know, that we have seen in the course or, you know, maybe you've seen in the media. Yeah, that's a great one. What are your favorite applications of RL? There are a couple of applications that uh, in which the objective cannot be, um, for instance, molecular design, the objective, you cannot differentiate it and the decision space is very large. So RL is explored as a way to encode the goals in the reward and, and use a policy to make the decisions. Good, good. So when the reward is not differentiable, but can be expressed, RL can be a great way to, uh, to identify solutions. Okay, good. So let's, let's jump in. So this is uh, the rough outline. Uh, Polka tells me that you guys have, already, uh, have actually already discussed the Rubik's Cube. So um, I may uh, skip or uh, be very quick on that part. So um, what we will cover is, uh, one perspective, which is that every problem is an RL problem. Okay. Uh, and then we'll ask, well, is it? Okay, so hopefully this will be a pretty thoughtful lecture about 
what is an application for, for RL, especially today? That word today in this slide is actually quite important. Okay. And by today, I mean today plus, you know, five, 10 years. I don't mean like literally today. Okay. All right. So every problem is an RL problem. We'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll talk about, we're going to take a sort of data driven approach to this problem of what is suitable for RL. So it's getting a little bit meta. We're going to look at examples that are uh, applications of RL that have been successful. Okay, and successful can mean all sorts of things. So I just drew an arbitrary uh, line in the sand where uh, people have put in a lot of energy to validate uh, these approaches, these applications and whatnot to demonstrate, you know, this is something that RL can do that other methods cannot do. And we were very careful about assessing this. Okay, and there, the, this line that I drew in the sand, there aren't that many examples. So that should actually um, cause us to question, like if every, if every problem is an RL problem and, a, and RL can do everything, like why are there so few examples? Okay, so that's the question I want you to have throughout this lecture and we're gonna keep returning to it. What is RL good for? roughly speaking today. Okay, okay so let's first, um, uh, I don't know if this is the elephant in the room or not, or whatnot, <clears throat> but let's cover this point of every problem being, our, being an RL problem. Okay, so here are all the problems that are RL problems. Okay, so single stage problems. So for instance, supervised learning, you can think of as an RL problem, right? You're making one decision. It's just a single stage. Okay, so uh, single stage problems you can think of as uh, full feedback or partial feedback. So like in bandit settings, where we don't get um, feedback from the arms that you did not pull, for instance. These are single stage problems and they can be thought of as RL problems, as baby RL problems, okay, where the horizon is equal to one. Um, there are problems where the model is known and the model is unknown. So I'm sure you've discussed model free RL in this course. Uh, well, even when you do, the, do know the model, you can still do RL, right? It's just that when you don't have the model, you can also do RL. Okay, but there are also other approaches. There's optimal control, there's model predictive control. And so when you're given a, a, an exact problem, you have to wonder, well, should I be doing RL, which is uh, like, a very general tool, or do I take some other approaches? Okay, but that said, these model known and model unknown problems are still RL problems. Okay, then we can talk about deterministic or stochastic problems, okay, uh, in terms of the transitions. So uh, you may have discussed this perspective as well. Shortest path problems, deterministic shortest path problems are also sequential decision problems. They are deterministic problems, but nonetheless, they are sequential decision problems of choosing you go to this city, then this city, then this city, then this city to shorten your overall uh, path. Uh, so you can take a dynamic, you can take a dynamic programming or uh, reinforcement le learning approach, but we also have other better algorithms like Dijkstra's and A star. Okay, when the system has stochastic transitions in certain cases. Um, these are, these can be specific problems like queuing systems and there, there may be analytical solutions. Okay. However, if we zoom out, they can be viewed as RL problems. Okay. And so on and so forth. This can go on and on. This can be probably be a whole, uh, a whole rant of a half an hour. Okay. So the point is, this is, uh, th we have a lot of tools in our toolbox. And RL is one big hammer. Okay, so just because every problem is an RL problem doesn't mean we necessarily want to use RL. Okay. So when do we want to use RL? This is where we're going to take this uh, data-driven approach. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll pause here actually to see if there are any questions. All right. All right, so we're gonna take this data-driven approach and we wanna see, uh, all right, we have some data. The data are some, <clears throat> some example applications. 
like Alpha Star, like uh, uh, like Alpha Go, like the Atari games, like uh, the Rubik's Cube, and many of the examples that you've seen in this course. And let's those are our data, okay? And these each of these problems has some characteristics, such as how expensive was the data, how big is the problem, and all this. And if we can look at these examples, then maybe we can draw some insights into what RL can do today. Okay, so this is not an easy problem, but here is one attempt at uh, dissecting the, uh, the solution space or the space of uh, what RL is good at. Okay, so here's one axis. <clears throat> this axis is the solution, uh, the, the, the solution space, the size of the solution space. Okay. Um, so this has to do with the size, the length of the horizon. And just give me one second. I'm trying to readjust where I put all of your faces so I can also see the slides. All right. So, all right, so we have one axis, which is the solution space. This has to do with the size of the state space and the horizon and the size of the action space, which you're uh, familiar with from this course. Um, and we can, you know, we can give it an RL problem, like given Atari, given a self-driving car, we can put it along this axis somewhere. Okay, uh, that's probably not enough. Let's put a second axis on the table. Uh, so this has to do with how well defined the objective is. Okay, so we know in RL we have a reward function, and that reward function, depending on its characteristics, whether it's sparse or whether it's dense, whether it's shaped or not, that you know can uh, dramatically encourage or discourage uh, finding a solution. Okay, and some problems are naturally come with a a reward or an objective that is uh, more poorly defined or or better defined. And so based on this, we can also plot the applications uh, on, uh, on this space. Okay, so can anyone tell me uh, if, if this was our simplified world, where would RL be most suitable? So maybe you can shout out the quadrant or type the quadrant in the chat. Cool. Someone said first quadrant. So I guess it's not really numbers. So I, I'll just assume you made the right choice. So this quadrant right here, the first quadrant. Uh, yes, that's correct. So uh, we can visualize it roughly like this. Uh, so this darker green color is where RL is well suited. And then we get this gradient um, to RL being less, uh, less suitable. Okay, so small solution spaces, well-defined objective, uh, RL can rock. Okay, other solutions may also rock these, uh, these problems. Okay, but at least if we ignore all other solution methods, just think about the, these two axes and just think about RL, RL is doing well here. Uh, of course, we're, we're trying to expand the uh, capabilities of RL as well. Okay, so now, now that we have these axes, let's, try to, let's start putting, uh, putting the data onto these axes. So here's one. This is the space of games. Okay, so we have Atari, we have Go, we have AlphaStar. These are sort of arbitrary, but let's consider uh, like they have differences in terms of the solution space, okay. uh, and but they are what they share is that they have a very well defined objective. Okay, you win or you don't. You have a score. Okay, let's put another one on this table. So uh, here's human intelligence. It's very poorly defined. Uh, very large solution space. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, so recommendation systems, these are like your product recommendations, your search engines, uh, your uh, web advertising. Uh, and there are also some systems that can help, uh, can do uh, personalized health recommendations. Okay, so here's a space as well. These tend to have 
<clears throat> small solution spaces. And we'll talk about this more later. Let's add another category. So here is uh, a space of robotics and autonomy questions. So we have uh, on the on the end of the so smaller solution spaces, <clears throat> we have some work <clears throat> uh, on traffic flow smoothing, which I'll talk more about, Google Loon, which I'll talk more about, uh, and increasing in solution, si uh, solution space size, getting to uh, robotic manipulation is not well-defined. This is like a ton, a ton of different problems. And I'm sure you're, you're all more aware of this than I am. Uh, one very well, defined problem uh, is this Rubik's Cube problem. And then we have larger problems such as logistics and infrastructure planning problems. Okay, so these vary um, a little bit in terms of how well-defined the objectives are, but they're uh, sort of in the same ballpark. Uh, they differ in the solution space. They differ in the degrees of freedom, in the problem size, in the horizon, and so on. Okay, and then I have self-driving cars down here, which is uh, moderately large of a solution space. And it's one of its challenges is how, uh, is, is that the objective is not well-defined. Okay, and then one last circle is just, uh, just calling out that multi-agent systems uh, tend to be on the right-hand side of this space of uh, sort of large solution space problems. So any reactions to this, uh, you know, this table right here, this, 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 uh, I don't know, let's call it, this data dump of um, RL examples. I'll draw one more line while I wait for uh, your responses. So here's like a rough curve that indicates where we are. So here's the, the purple curve is to, to the, the upper, right, uh, upper left-hand side is uh, what we have accomplished. And below is you know, work in progress. So I would have a few questions. Why is this curve so wiggly? And maybe, you know, any other, any reactions to the spaces of problems? So, so, so maybe, you know, I mean, we can have a small poll say how many people agree with this division versus how many people do not agree. Yeah, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, if I pull up your the participants, can I see? Are there Maybe. options to react or something? I mean, there's not an option to react, but maybe people can just type on the chat. So I think you know, if you agree with this division or this layout, you can say yes. If you disagree, you can say no. Yeah, great. It seems like everyone needs a dose of morning coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's 11 a.m., guys. It's almost <laughs> noon. It's afternoon siesta, then. <laughs> so we have a good question in the chat. Are we that far from self-driving cars? So no one, so people in general do not agree or disagree. <laughs> You're just abstaining from taking the vote. You know, I think you should just come in and take a vote, you know, just yes or no. <laughs> we have one agreement. We have a nice question in the chat as well for large solution space and good objectives, uh, quadrant two. That's a good idea. Next time I'll name, I'll label the quadrants. Or I'll, uh, next time I'll number the quadrants. Uh, what is the alternative? Uh, Ayush, do you mean uh, what are alternative solution approaches? Yeah, like I was wondering, like RL seems to be the more flexible infrastructure. Like if you mean both model-free and model-based yeah. methods, so it's like I was generally curious, like 
how do you really go about thinking those pro- thinking about those problems then for a large solution space and good objectives yeah so i can say so there's a large field of of uh, planning model based planning and that is typically in the second quadrant i would say so so like increasingly you can sort of pitch a lot of multi agent systems as being model free like like there's a lot of work like last couple of years where people are trying to sort of model behavior at a human society level like salesforce had this project called ai economist i see there is some work in public health as well like these are problems where it will be very difficult to actually have a model of the system so it's like if you don't do rl like how do you really think about the problems like if you have a model then you can do a lot of stuff yeah so it's tricky um because if you uh so you uh so i personally don't like the term model free so much um so i prefer to use model agnostic and the reason i prefer model agnostic is that there's still a model even f- when even for the model free approaches it's just that the model is in the form of a simulation or in the form of uh like something that's not a set of mathematical equations or it can even be a model in the form of mathematical equations it might just be that the, those mathematical equations are not differentiable or something like that so there's still a model and the the issue with uh some of these works uh not not these works in particular but in general some of the problems with using rl for these large problems and these societal problems is that model still needs to be very good it needs to be very high quality because reinforcement learning especially deep reinforcement learning is a uh it is data driven so garbage in garbage out so if your model is garbage uh even if it's a simulation or even if it's mathematical equations it doesn't matter what form it takes if it's not very good if it's not if it does not capture the the characteristics of the true problem then the outcome uh we should have limited confidence in the results and so with some of this it has it really has to do with the quality of the model which really has to do with the the domain and how well we understand the domain i don't know if that answers your question got it it does then i actually have a follow up question i don't know if it's relevant then like if you think about the first quadrant would you say that like a lot of people in conventional departments would contest that rl is an overkill for a lot of problems in like what departments in, you say in like control theory and those fields like people might be already solving problems on the first quadrant without using rl and it's like would you say that rl can solve these problems but other methods can also or it's like you definitely need rl to make solutions possible yeah uh yes and no so what i am really excited to talk about is this google loon project so in in some sense yes the rl can be overkill sometimes and it is overkill sometimes uh like rl for cart pull is overkill and i think most people would agree with that um but there are control problems that are beyond the reach of con- like classical control and so uh i'm personally very excited about this google loon result uh so we'll we'll be talking about that Okay, there is a very long comment. Uh, see if I can. Yeah, I can um maybe make sense on mute and just uh kind of talk what I was um thinking. Yeah, great. Um so I I guess like uh for a lot of tasks the kind of explicit you know space of solutions could appear like pretty small. Um so uh like this was an example that I I I think like professor Tedrick had said um in like robotic manipulation class last uh semester but like I you know I think he you know, talks a lot about dishwashing robots and if if you know you wanted to make a dishwashing robot the actual task itself might be like pretty um uh simple to specify and sit in a pretty small space so like just you know be able to pick up dishes and wash them um but there's this whole like background of the world that that you also need to know how to interact with like it's not just confined to whatever's happening in the sink um you know if you successfully wash the dish but at the cost of like throwing a mug out the window and breaking the glass or something um like that's a fail task right so the kind of solution space includes like the bad solutions right where if you were to like project it just down to the um like dishwashing task the the 
the solution where you throw something at the window but still wash the dish like looks the same as the one where you didn't throw something out the window and also wash the dish. Um, so like viewed from that perspective, it seems like the space is almost like uncountably large. Like it's just impossible to enumerate all the things that you shouldn't do um, in, in how you interact with the world. I, I agree. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't have a deeper response than that, but I agree. Yeah. Yeah, there is a really nice and growing area on model specification. So it's very important that we also specify the right problems uh, that we wish to solve. So here, uh, here we're restricting to uh, like, we're, we've restricted the scope of the problem. And uh, we are not considering uh, that factor, which is very important. To me, one, one comment over there also is that the problem description and the solution space are two different things. That the problem description could be very concise, so the solution space could be really big. Right? For example, as you said, you know, washing dishes and putting them, you know, is a very concise description. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that the problem space is small. Right? That if you think in terms of you know, what are all possible actions you could be doing in the kitchen that space is humongous, mm -hmm. right? So in that space, we need to find some very specific solution, which is going to give the reward. So, you know, I, mm -hmm. I see that as a large solution space with a small problem description. And that's mm -hmm. exactly the kind of problems, you know, which is close to human intelligence because, you know, because you make it so concise, it's very poorly defined because we don't specify a lot of constraints which we as humans assume but a robot may not know about i think this is very interesting right. yeah and how to incorporate the problem description length <clears throat> into into this is interesting okay so there is one factor i wanted to add to this table to sort of help explain the squiggly this of the lines, uh, which has to do with the cost of data. So again, we're, we're going to restrict down to the solution space. The solution space you can think of as like the, uh, the state action space to the power of the horizon, something like that. Um, all right, so the cost of data uh, varies across these different examples. So in some of these, the data is actually very cheap. Uh, because they come in the form of a simulation. Uh, so that is the case of uh, video games, is the case of traffic simulation, is the case of combinatorial optimization. Uh, it is not the case of web advertising, but web advertising happens at a pretty high frequency. So in that sense, the data is cheap. Uh, for some others, the data is a little bit less cheap because you need to like actually have a robot uh, do something and uh, maybe for a longer time horizon, it takes more time to collect, um, collect uh, enough data. And then there are uh, additional examples where the cost is very expensive because uh, of safety reasons, ethics reasons, um, you know, uh, time is slow, that kind of thing. Okay, so this can help explain to some extent the squiggliness, like this health advice is a very small problem uh, but uh, we can't like use it on too many people, for instance. And so that might explain why um, uh, it has not been uh, solved yet. Okay, so uh, this, you know, is I think a good for a thought exercise. This is, you know, not hard science. This is taking examples and trying to dissect some factors Okay, um, and with this, uh, if we you know, more or less agree with this, then we can start to think about, okay, how do we manipulate problems in this space? Or how do we look a little bit deeper? So uh, a couple like pretty easy things is uh, one, uh, well, if this is the quadrant that's suitable, then maybe we wanna take these problems and like push them in this direction. Okay, and there are a few ways to do so directly. Uh, or indirectly. So we want to, we basically want to reduce the time horizon. Okay, so we can just reduce the time horizon. 
we can you know twiddle the the discount factor we can tempo, uh, we can uh, incorporate temporal abstractions options hierarchy various ways to push the problem into this space okay because we actually designed this problem right so even though i wrote self-driving cars as like it looks like it's like one specific point um and uh, uh and and many of these problems they are sort of fungible we uh from the from a standpoint of engineering a solution we define the MDP, right? We define uh, we define the problem, and so we can, we have some influence over where it ends up in this space. Okay. Similarly, we can design more informative features that can have the effect of reducing the state space or the action space, and so on. Similarly, we can push the problem in uh, uh, up uh, through reward shaping if we have some information about what the solution should look like, or if we have some data of the solution, we can do something like imitation learning. Okay, so I hope that this is at least gives a helpful mental image for uh, where applications fall into the problem space, uh, into the solution space, let's say, into the capabilities of RL and how one can actually start to manipulate it. Okay, so um, I will fly through some of these as examples for uh, to provide some grounding and ask you for your reflections on, uh, on these. So we'll start with recommendation systems. Okay, so recommendation systems. Uh, so I'm gonna specifically talk about Reagent, which is, a, which is Facebook's open source applied RL platform uh, from last year. And one of its special characteristics is that unlike a lot of systems, it's designed for production rather than prototyping. So this actually gives a sense of, uh, you know, RL is ready, or Facebook believes that RL is ready, ready enough that they want to put engineering resources into it and actually push things into their products. Okay, so the specific use case that uh, I'll discuss a little bit is push notifications. Okay, so here's just a diagram that uh, uh, overviews their um, their overall system, where, <clears throat> uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a bit more specifically. <clears throat> so they have several design principles as part of Reagent. So some of this will seem familiar to you if you've taken like a distributed systems course or a software engineering course. Um, so several design uh, principles. Uh, it's very important to be able to handle these large data sets, um, which uh, really, uh, really calls into calls into the value of multi-GPU distributed training. Uh, we want to be able to pre-process the data automatically. And it is very difficult to understate the importance of this, even though to from a from the standpoint of a researcher, this feels like uh, you know small parts, but this is extremely important in a production system. Having a standardized MDP format, uh, doing autom automatic um, pre-processing such as feature normalization. They have a suite of algorithms that are competitive. Uh, and they're able to do off policy evaluations so that they can uh, anticipate the performance of a policy before they deploy it on to uh, real customers. Okay. Um, they're able to serve a variety of different kinds of policies and they have a bunch of regression testing. So let's, let's talk specifically about this push notification case study that they did. So the goal is to connect people with the most important updates when they matter. So that's sort of not a very well-defined objective. Uh, it's sort of, but it, one can make it uh, well-defined. So just in case you're not aware, uh, push notification is a thing that shows up on your phone, uh, in this case, specifically from Facebook. Uh, and these, these notifications show up uh, in response to your own posts, uh, updates from your friends, followed pages or groups, interested events, and so on. And so uh, tip, the classical approach is a supervised learning approach. So one would um, say, uh, if I send this notification, uh, what is the predicted click-through rate, CTR, or the likelihood that the notification leads to a meaningful reaction, uh, interaction? Okay, and then basically, based on, uh, based on this model, they can filter whether or not to issue a push notification. So the issue is that this ignores long-term value. Okay, this is a very coarse, uh, a coarse signal. And it is difficult to individualize because in order to individualize this, we would need some kind of supervised set for you know, every customer or every type of customer. Okay, so instead let's formulate this as an MDP. So the action is to send or drop the notification. 
the state is features about the person and the notification uh, candidate. Uh, we have rewards, which are um, uh, uh, interactions and activities on Facebook, uh, and a, as well as a control penalty for sending too many no notifications. I was not able to find what gamma they use, what discount factor. Uh, if any of you do find it, I'll be interested. Um, this they retrained uh, daily, and each batch or each uh, when they rate, when they train this daily, they're able to update with tens of millions of state transitions. So this speaks to the low cost of data. Um, so from this, they found significant performance and activity on Facebook as compared to supervised learning. Uh, no more specifics in terms of numbers or anything were given. Okay, so in, several, in these examples, what I really wanna point out is uh, not only highlighting examples that are, are, are as close to RL working as possible, but what makes them work. So there's a nice pedagogy uh, concept called a near miss, which I'll use here. A near miss is, you know, uh, here's a concept. If I remove this, so if I have a near miss, then the concept is no longer this concept. And so that can help you understand like what this concept is. So uh, some of the near misses here are, uh, you know, even if we, even if a, say a different company were to uh, follow this exact same pipeline, it may not work. And why is that? Uh, the the high frequency and the scale of data that Facebook has might be what allows, what enables this. Okay, so that's one thing to, to think about. Another near miss is that there's a very low penalty for an incorrect decision. Okay, so there is opportunity to make incorrect decisions and have the system learn. Okay, the reliability needed for the algorithms in these use cases is not that high. This is not a judgment statement of whether it's good or bad. This is a property of this application. Okay, and also interestingly, this problem is still valid for short time horizons. I said I could not find gamma, and it doesn't matter that I couldn't find gamma because gamma could have been, it, the time horizon could have been one, it could have been two, it could have been three, and it's still a valid problem. If instead this were a control problem and we were to solve a problem for three, uh, three seconds rather than 10 seconds, that problem may not be valid. Uh, there's a good question in the chat about implementing this uh, in a different context and how many users and frequency do you think is needed? I do not know and I think it'll depend on the complexity of your objective, unfortunately, but I'll be happy to talk about it. Um, okay, so um, there are other uh, platforms out there as well. It's not, not just Facebook. So Microsoft has one as well uh, that focuses on contextual bandits. And it was actually deployed a bunch sooner and was able to show a 25% increase in click-through rates. And there's also some theory that goes along with um, their, uh, their platform, which shows an exponential improvement over A-B testing uh, by use of off-policy evaluation. So I won't talk more about this here, but I recommend uh, taking a look at uh, this, this white paper if you're interested. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, go through a second example and then, um, uh, yeah, and then we'll, I'll see if there's a room for a mini discussion. Okay, so here I'm gonna, here's an example actually from my own work. So this is a example, an application in traffic control. Um, and the question is uh, about self-driving cars. So here's a video. This is all vehicles being autonomous. There's this beautiful, you know, weaving, no stopping at the intersection. Everything is, everything's wonderful. And we're living in the future. And it's very, either depending on you, you could be very stressed looking at this or you could be very calmed. I don't know what you are. Okay, so um, uh, the question that I've been interested in is I want to assess the impact of self-driving cars on traffic flow, okay? And specifically, I wanna look at the, the setting where not all of the vehicles are autonomous. Okay, so the question is, in this video, if even one of the vehicles was not self-driving, will we see any benefit in throughput and energy and safety and so on uh, before 100% adoption? Okay. Otherwise, we're banking a lot on like everyone adopting and then you know, at 100%, we see a spike in utilization and um, utility. Okay, but you know, maybe it doesn't look like that. Maybe it's a more gradually increase in performance 
Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the research studies this 100% case. Okay, so there are implications for infrastructure planning if we get some near-term benefits for public health, for safety, for equity, for climate change. Okay, so uh, this is sort of a complicated problem right now. So let's, you know, where do we start? We start with the simplest thing. So here's an example from uh, 2008. Uh, Polkett, you may have, I don't know if you covered this in your course already, uh, so I can speed up. Can we just briefly look at as an, as an example, but we didn't okay. really do any details, just like a video example. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, so here's an example from uh, 2008, uh, and it's, uh, it's like a very physics approach to this problem. Okay, we, wanna, we, want, we want the simplest MDP possible. Okay, so that's sort of what phys physicists do. They boil all the complexity away, and here's, the, here's like the simplest possible thing. You have cars driving in a circle, and it turns out that cars driving in a circle, traffic jams still arise. So um, let me play it again. Okay, so car, the cars, uh, I apologize for the delay. Okay, so the cars start out evenly spaced, but you can see that there's like a, a clump of cars forming here. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, during part of the video, the cars even come to a complete stop. Okay, so this is stop and go traffic, emergent from just human to human driving interaction. No stop signs, no traffic lights. Okay, so, this is a very natural starting point where we say, okay, uh, we want to understand the impact of self-driving cars on traffic jams, on traffic congestion. We can take this environment, we can swap out a fraction of these vehicles for autonomous ones, and we can study this impact without any you know, of that complexity that we don't need anyway. Okay, so here's what we did. We, repli we replicated this experiment and we have one self-driving car here. Uh, this is done in a traffic micro simulation some micro simulation called Sumo. Uh, and our color scheme is red is automated, uh, blue is the observed vehicle, and then white are unobserved vehicles. Um, so this is a one dimensional control problem. So we're, all we're doing is issuing the acceleration of this red vehicle. Um, the, uh, right, I should say the state is just the uh, relative velocity of between these two vehicles and the headway of this vehicle. So this gap right here. Um, the reward is actually the average velocity for all vehicles in the system though. Okay. Um, and the time step is uh, 0.1 seconds in, in real time and uh, the horizon is five minutes in real time. Okay. Uh, and we use TRPO. So here's sort of what we find in the end. So uh, at first the autonomous vehicle is off so that we can see, the, uh, see these waves uh, forming. I apologize for the delay. Okay, uh, then the vehicle sw uh, switches on at this dotted line and the vehicle sort of takes on a different driving profile. At first it opens up a gap, but then it uh, quickly closes it. And uh, we can see from that point on there are uh, the traffic jams are, and the traffic waves are suppressed. So there's a question on how do you characterize the difference between human drivers and self-driving agents uh, yeah, so here the human agents are not learned. They are actually human driver models calibrated to human driving data. So if we take these results and we plot them into a broader perspective, so uh, in the x-axis is vehicle density. So you can think of this as different numbers of vehicles on that ring or different ring lengths uh, or circumferences. And the y-axis is the average velocity. Um, the physics video that I showed um, corresponds to traffic jams or a stable equilibrium of the system. Okay, so as the density increases, the average velocity decreases. Okay, and this is where you have stop and go traffic. Um, we can also compute using control theory, uh, this upper bound, which is an optimal, but it's an unstable equilibrium. Uh, and then there's some state of the art and then we can see our work and we can, we can compare it relative to this upper bound. We don't know if this is achievable, uh, but we do know that this is a, an approximate upper bound. And so we do find that we are pretty close to, uh, we closely track this upper bound. Um, what we find ultimately is that uh, having this 5% of vehicles uh, automated leads to a 50% improvement in velocity for all the vehicles, which is quite neat. Um, it's near optimal. It's robust, and what I mean by that is that this white regime is actually the training regime, and then we also test 
in lighter tropic as well as denser tropic. So hard, easier and harder settings. Um, one thing that I love about this is that the training time is very fast. It's like a few hours on a single CPU. Um, uh, and now what makes this work? Okay, so one thing that makes us work is actually that is partially observed. So rather than observing the whole system, we observe part of the system and that actually increases, that actually speeds up the training. Okay, so the neural network is very small, for instance. Another aspect that makes this work is that we, we actually can derive this upper bound from control theory, but we don't have the means to synthesize a controller that performs at this upper bound. We don't even know if that's possible. Okay, but it, it tells us sufficient performance. Okay. Uh, with this RL policy generalized to non-circular track, I wonder if good performance in, non, in urban networks will be different from the non-circular track. Yes, so it actually does. And unfortunately, I don't have a video of that here. Uh, but what, but that's, exact, that's a very great question and we exactly took the same policy and we used it as pre-training for an open network. Uh, and yeah, it uh, increases performance. But of course, uh, one would want to fine tune on the open network. But it was a, yeah, it was something that we were interested in. Okay, so then um, that's just a starting point. Again, we wanted to start with the simplest thing and see you know, what could a fraction of vehicles do. But then we're curious about more uh, you know, different settings and not just different settings for the, for the heck of it, but different settings for different traffic phenomenon. So this single lane ring allows it, allowed us to study uh, traffic jams or traffic congestion. A multi-lane ring like this allows us, allows us to start studying uh, lane changes. Um, this network allows us to start studying merging. This intersection right here, that's a closed network, allows us to just isolate intersection dynamics, highways, urban driving and so on, uh, traffic lights. Okay, so we started doing this and with, we basically find that with 10 to 15, per, uh, sorry, five to 10% of autonomous vehicles, we find um, a pretty dramatic increase in uh, speed, like average speed or throughput in this case. Okay, so what are some near misses? Okay, so traffic is notoriously difficult to analyze. And some of the reasons for this is that you can think of it as a set of cascaded nonlinear dynamics where you have a vehicle, which is a nonlinear uh, system already that is followed by another vehicle. And so the dynamics of this vehicle affect this vehicle. So it's a cascade of nonlinear dynamics plus you know, the traffic light is also a nonlinear dynamical system and pedestrians are also nonlinear dynamical systems and so are the bicycles and, and whatnot. And this whole thing is the, is the traffic system. So that's difficult. There are delayed effects. So, you know, it could be a little bit of a mistake of one vehicle that ultimately translates three minutes later into a traffic jam, okay. Uh, and also it could be the correct action that a vehicle takes that translates into resolving a traffic jam three minutes later, okay. Uh, these are multi-agent, they're partially observed. Okay, so these are just some of the challenges. However, um, human driving is fairly predictable in aggregate. So there's a ecosystem of urban simulations that simulation tools that people actually use to design cities, to plan cities. So in aggregate, uh, human driving is predictable enough that we can actually rely on them to uh, make real world decisions. So we can also make use of them to uh, you know, perform some research studies. Okay. And this fairly predictable uh, aspect allows us to um, simulate data. And so we have enough data for the inefficient RL algorithms right now. Okay, so just a bit of a teaser. Uh, so one of the things that we're working on now is uh, we can't really with, with like low compute um, just directly train on a much larger system like this. So this is a three by three grid network. Um, so some of the challenges being long horizons, multi-agent coordination and control and whatnot. Um, but what we are able to find is that with just, uh, with some tweaks, uh, with 10% of autonomous vehicles, we can uh, get a 26% improvement over a human driving baseline. And this is what a result uh, looks like. So there are no um, traffic lights here. 
no stop sign, like, or I guess there, there are stop signs, but um, the autonomous vehicles are basically learning to uh, coordinate and basically learning to be traffic lights in this network without traffic lights so that you can have some improved efficiency over uh, human vehicles just sort of switching off one at a time. These autonomous vehicles are learning to platoon uh, chain like 10 vehicles at a time, okay, which leads to this improvement. Um, so some tweaks that make this work are uh, shared parameter homogenous multi-agent training. Uh, the second being restricted observation space that we also found in earlier experiments. Uh, and then also zero shot uh, transfer learning uh, from a different scenario, which is, I won't get into the details here. All right, so based on this, let's, let's have a, a, a brief reflection. What do you think RL is good for based on these, um, these examples? So we, so far we've focused on these sort of smaller solution space problems. Recall as we, we've been studying like one like very, very small dimensional um, problems. So there's a question about how the action, state action space dimensions manage in transfer learning in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that we have to be careful about. We have to, um, we have to make them the same or we have to make it, we have to make the action, the state action dimensions compatible. There was a comment. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I think it's still very early days. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, graph neural networks are pretty good. Uh, but I think it's still early. Okay, so how, what have we learned from these two examples? Like what makes RL work? Good models and a lot of data. Good. Okay, then we can move on. Okay, so here's another in, there's another insight from this work. This, I, I love this work. Okay, so Google Loon work from last year. Uh, so the application here is high altitude balloon navigation. So uh, the whole goal is uh, to use these high altitude balloons to provide internet in remote uh, locations. So there's a station here. And if the balloon can keep within the station keeping range, um, then it can like beam, you know, beam internet down. Okay. So um, uh, the main result here is that after, uh, after uh, success in simulation, they were able to deploy successfully for 3,000 uh, uh, 3, flight hours for two months over the Pacific Ocean. That's pretty good, pretty good. So why is this a good use case for RL? This is a very, very, very complicated control problem. Okay, wind is very, very complicated. This is, uh, you know, why we can't always predict the weather. Okay, so weather is very, very difficult. Um, so it's also a very, very long time horizon problem. Okay, you let the balloon go and then you want it back in a few months. <clears throat> so, um, so there's, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult controlled problem the dynamics are very complicated and it's also partially observed. Okay. You don't observe the whole like wind field, even if you could understand it. Okay. And that's difficult for con conventional control techniques. Okay. So let's throw RL at it and see what it does. So here's the action space. Um, basically the balloon can stay. And these then. Okay. So this is important to keep in mind. We like the balloon does not move left or right. It moves up and down and then the wind carries it left or right. Okay, so if you wanna go left, you go to an altitude where the wind is blowing left. Okay, so that's just uh, good to keep in your head. The time step is three minutes. The horizon is roughly two days. So about a thousand steps. The learning algorithm is a DQN variant. I'm not gonna talk about the details. The state is a feature vector of 
very sensible quantities like the height of the balloon, the battery charge, and so on. And then also this vector uh, that's pretty long of the uh, what's called the wind column. And that is the uh, magnitude and relative uh, uh, direction of wind. Okay. Uh, so the balloon might be here and uh, it gets the, the direction and magnitude of wind for uh, like a discretized set three, 361 numbers uh, along uh, that altitude. Uh, along that um, that location, okay. Because recall, I can like move up or down. Okay, uh, the reward is something like uh, whether it's within the the station, uh, the station's range. Okay, and then if not, some penalty outside of it. So it's like uh, good if we're within the range, and bad if not. Okay, and it looks like there's a little bit of reward shaping here. Okay, so some tweaks that made it work. So uh, one important aspect is data augmentation. So uh, again, wind is very difficult to model. Okay, it's still active research. It requires high performance computing right now. Um, so this, the solution is to use data from previous balloon flights, but that's not enough. Okay, so the uh, so just for um, reference, the data cost is about two hundred times that of Atari for collecting data, and it still cannot be used to evaluate the case where uh, the agent deviates significantly from the collected data. Okay, so this training just on this would lead to a pretty like not robust solution. So the solution was to, is to use the historical wind data, such as here, and to modify it uh, with procedural noise to generate arbitrary amounts of high resolution wind fields. So question, why is this sufficient to serve as a quote unquote simulator? Why is this a good idea? Good. Okay, so there's a comment about domain randomization. Okay, so let's see. I think there's a difference. So in domain randomization, I think you initialize the, uh, you randomize the initialization, but you don't like randomize the whole simulation, right? So here, uh, we don't have a simulation at all. So we're, the whole thing is randomized. Right, because recall that wind is difficult to model. So we do use historical wind, but we can't interact with it. Whereas in domain randomization, say you have a bunch of blocks and you like change the color of the background, but then you can like move the blocks and like the color of the background is still like what you said it as. Maybe Kathy, what you're trying to point is that in domain dynamization, you have a similar parameters that you can vary very easily, and you can randomize those parameters and do forward simulation. Versus in this case, you cannot do forward simulation. So you end That's up right. taking historical data, yeah. and then you modify the historical data in many ways. Yeah. But why is, yeah, so that, yes, that's exactly the question. But why is historical information enough? Because 
this is a sequential problem, right? We interact with the world and then the world changes. Because you can sample a distribution based on the, on the data and it is enough to capture all variability that you can encounter in the real world after that. Okay, I think I'm okay. I I think I'm making a more subtle point. So um, so let's let's try to think about this in the context of yes. Okay, good. Okay, so we have this in the chat. Okay, the there is an assumption, an implicit assumption, that the actions taken do not affect the environment. Do not affect the wind field at least. The only part of the state that is affected we can model. Because, you know, if we take the action of the balloon going down, we can say, okay, that part of the state of the balloon's like position, like we can simulate that part. The balloon's going down. But the balloon does not modify the wind field. So it does not affect part of the state. And that part of the state, thus we can use a historical uh, reading. Okay. So, so the near miss is that we are very, very, very fortunate here to have a simulator because we don't actually have one. Okay, there's, uh, so if we didn't have the historical data, we wouldn't have a simulator. We're basically using the historical data as a simulator. Um, and yes, so the point being that the balloon actions do not affect the wind currents. So if a, a visual is helpful, you can think of like as a little fish swimming in the ocean the the little fish has very very little uh, effect on the ocean dynamics, as opposed to in most of the settings that we talk about RL, like in robotics, in like many things, like your actions actually change the environment. So if you pick up a block, like the environment has changed. But in this problem your actions do not affect the, the, uh, the wind field, let's say. Okay, good. So uh, that makes us a suitable <clears throat> uh, problem for RL because we have data, okay. If we, if, you know, if some of this were violated, if we, if the actions did affect the wind, we would really have no simulator. Okay, so here we have data, we have a simulator. Um, the red is the result of the RL controller and then the blue is the previous state of the art. So this is like a team of control engineers uh, designing a controller. So um, here uh, we wanna keep 50, 50 kilometers within the station, uh, within range of the station. And the red controller uh, is able to do so uh, more of the time. Okay. And it actually makes use of that full range uh, more so than the classical controller. Okay, so um, yeah, so there's a nice video. I believe the top is the, this is like a whole bunch of simulation runs. So uh, I believe it's like 125 simulation runs. The top is the uh, RL controller, which like keeps like pretty close distance. The bottom is the uh, control, um, uh, sort of an engineered controller. Okay, so this is sort of deviating quite a bit. All right, okay, so that's mostly what I wanted to say. So uh, I will maybe talk a little bit about AlphaStar if we have time, but I actually wanted to have a discussion now. Okay, so. All right, so let's return to the question that we started with. What makes RL, what makes a problem suitable for, for RL today? So here's like a, a straw man. And the question will be, do you agree or disagree? Is this a useful characterization? What's missing? What is RL good at? Okay, so this is the discussion I wanna have. And here's sort of uh, like putting together the pieces of what we've discussed. What, is, what makes a problem suitable for, for RL is whether an algorithm can effectively find a good solution, okay, given the cost of data to the quality needed. 
And each of these can be broken down a little bit. So a good solution, uh, some factors are the solution space, uh, as well as the, uh, like, depending on how, on the objective. Given the cost of data, that means time, money, ethics, safety, and to the quality needed. Um, this factors in robustness, reliability, optimality, and also relative to what. And this, these question marks here can include other approaches. So better than other approaches. Okay, so do you agree or disagree? Is this a useful characterization? What is missing? What is RL good at? Does this change what you think RL is good at? Does everyone agree with this characterization? It's very what? vague. I'm hoping there's some disagreement. So is this not true for any decision making? I mean, even if it is RL or not RL, is there something specific? About or RL? Mm, we have a, a very similar sounding comment in the chat. Yeah. So, Professor, I, I have a feeling that um, when we are, so since we are focusing on real world problems, that um, most of the applications that are trying to use RL, like are picking a specific motives to use RL. Is not, so um, I'm just trying to, to, to put that in the opposite angle, like instead of starting from RL as a generic and then try to find suitable problems, go to the application site and see which actually, which domains have actually picked RL. And um, in, in my view, I have the feeling that they are always kind of the very specific patterns. Like for instance, um, some systems that become uh, that scale and are too high dimensional for other optimization approaches to control. And, and they have to rely on RL because it's fast for them. And, and for instance, I'm seeing these in um, mega constellations in satellite communication. So the, the field is moving to RL because it's the only thing that can converge on time or control on real time there. Um, it might not be the one that, that works most robustly, more reliable, even not the most optimal if you had more, if you had more time to compute. Um, that's one I see. Another one I see is that you know, there are applications that need to leverage um, signals that, that like images, video, um, brain signals, and, and that's the motivation to, so you need that layer of, the, of input to be able to do the decision making in that sense. Um, so multimodality um, is one yeah. factor. Yeah, I would say so. And then, for the, all, all the applications that fold in the first quadrant, I had the feeling that a, 
an important part of the application was the long-term dependency in, in the decisions. So I have the feeling that those type of applications are looking in RL for a method to account for long-term dependencies in, in their decisions. So recommender systems and so on. And then I would say that on a fourth area of applications that are trying to use RL maybe would be um, those applications in which supervision is is really difficult, like you know, I put the example of molecular optimization. I know there are some combinatorial problems that are trying to be solved with RL. They are NP-hard problems, so I assume that having a data set of, of solutions is is not practical. So, um, so I would say. I, I try to look from that from that perspective because that kind of I think that reflects more the need of RL. Good, good. That's great. Anyone have anything to add? The question is sort of, if someone were to hand you a problem, how do you know if RL is good for it? So maybe there are some particular factors you're looking for, Kathy? No, this is a very general question. I mean, I have my own take, which I'll reveal in a few minutes. But I uh, wanted to get some input first. I guess um, there's like a bunch of characteristics that kind of make a problem good for RL or not RL. And you could kind of like go through this checklist. So for example, like, um, you know, is it, do you have a model available? If you do have a model available, maybe some kind of more classical control techniques can be used or something like MPC can be used. Um, do you have like a differentiable objective? Uh, if you don't, then that's kind of a good like plus one for RL. If you do, then maybe it's plus one for another method that can use those gradients. Um, do you have the ability to like collect data fast? And I guess fast is going to be context dependent, application dependent, like because RL is kind of somewhat, you know, less sample efficient than maybe like a model based method or something. Um, or sorry, model-free RL is, is less sample efficient. Um, like, can you make a simulator? Like, and, and then, you know, can you, do you actually influence your state or your environment to a reasonable degree? If you don't, maybe you like approach it from a bandit kind of uh, framework or, or viewpoint. And if you do strongly, then maybe RL is like a good approach. Good, I like that approach as well. I would say the main, like, or one main takeaway of this lecture is that it's not straightforward when a problem is an RL problem. If you consider the perspective of not every problem being an RL problem. Actually, it's very complicated. And actually, we don't have that many examples of problems that are RL problems. I actually mean to restrict to problems that are real world, like all the games are in here as well, okay, just to be clear. OK, let's, let, let me uh, give one a different perspective to this question, which is, um, uh, complementary, I think, 
to Juanjo's um, comments. Oops. Okay, so this is to view uh, what RL is good at in terms of uh, what you might call functional competencies. So these are, this is almost like a checklist. So given an application or given a problem, uh, you can sort of go through and see if some of the properties of the problems match the strengths of RL. Like whether the challenges match the strengths. Okay, so one, the first one, RL as online decision-making is the most classical view of RL. So this is, this is RL uh, making decisions on, online. So collecting data, updating, collecting data, updating. This is not the only perspective, but this is the most classical perspective. So this is the most commonly advertised, I guess, perspective. So um, this is very suitable for things like recommendation systems. And it's very good for short horizon non-stationary problems. So these are problems where you don't want to wait until the end before you like make any decisions. You want to learn as you go. So if you have a problem where that is a key characteristic, RL is very suitable. There are always special cases where another tool is more suitable. Okay. The second is uh, deep learning and then by inheritance, deep reinforcement learning as a compiler. So what I mean by compiler here is the ability to compile partial task specifications into full solutions. So as an example, we might have a partial solution of a task, like in robotics, we might have some examples of how to complete a task, but we don't have, we, we, we don't have the ability to like write down the full details of the task of like exactly how the arm should move uh, and like what order of things I should pick up and whatnot, uh, but we have examples. So the ability to um, compile these partial specifications in the form of imitation, in the form of reward shaping into a full solution and that full solution is the deep neural network. So this is good for cases where we know part of the solution to the problem. If we know the full solution, we can use some other method. Actually, if we knew like if we know sufficiently like much of the solution, uh, planning approaches tend to be pretty good as well. So a third is RLS fine tuning. So here um, here are some examples. So breakout, pong, pinball, Google Loon, industrial control. This is our one of RLS strengths is for high precision tasks. So this is one way to think about this is like. When is RL better than humans? Okay, humans are very bad at high precision tasks, especially for prolonged amounts of time. Okay, so this is another core competency, a functional competency of RL. And this last one is RL as heuristic search. Okay, so a few examples here are the traffic flow smoothing, alpha star, go, logistics and infrastructure planning. So this is where uh, data is cheap, but ex the exploration space is large, but also structured. So this is where RL is primarily used to search. All right, any final um, reactions? Instead of RLS as fine tuning, you can also say RLS search, right? So it seems like the third and the fourth point are pretty much the same things. Because like if you consider like breakout pong, these games, right? You can also learn from scratch. But I guess you're referring specifically where solution exists and they fine tune with RL. Is that the Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I would maybe put it, it's, 
yeah, I'm not sure how to be very precise about this right now, but there are problems that where we have existing approaches to like roughly solve it. And then there are problems where we don't, like we don't know what the answer is. And so for the problems where we do have approaches, it's still possible that RL is suitable. And that is if uh, high precision is uh, desirable because existing approaches may, be, may not be like sufficiently high precision. But like, we, you know, humans can, can balance and can juggle and, and whatnot. So we have a, uh, it's like a different baseline to a combinatorial optimization problem where we might not have a solution. But you're right, like maybe there is a way to word this in a way that captures both categories. Question, would you say action primitives would fall into com the compiler group? Um, that's a good question. Uh, what, uh, I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that. Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking that, like you may know things that aren't necessarily task specific, but are uh, I don't know if Isaac cut off or everyone else. Yeah, um, I would, okay, I, I will not claim that this is an exhaustive list. I think these are, uh, these are a few competencies that I think are clear enough from the data, uh, from the example, from the examples that given a new problem, we can check these. Uh, and it is very possible that the action primitives would um, like, so for instance, I don't know which of these uses action primitives, probably maybe alpha star uses some form of action primitive, uh, maybe not. Yeah, so I, I think it would take a little bit more, more digging. I mean, another interpretation is that the action primitives is not really an RL problem. Like action primitives are is some clustering of actions which can help us solve the exploration issue. Like you could apply action primitives to any one of these definitions, right? In online decision making, in RLS compiler or fine tuning or heuristic search, it almost feels like action primitive might be complementary to how right. It might be a different axis. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, I hope I hope this was a uh, informative discussion. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. So I'll turn it back to you, Pocket. Well, thanks a lot, Kathy, for trying to demystify and categorize, you know, RL into various groups. You know, it's always interesting to hear different perspectives on how we can approach RL. So thanks a lot for sharing your perspective and for finding time to do this guest lecture. So let's thank Kathy once more. And I, I think if there are, you know, maybe we have two minutes. So if there are some questions for Kathy, you know, feel free to uh, go for it. Or if there's something you want to bring up, you know, just as a discussion based on the course material we have studied until now or specifically in context of Kathy's lecture. No? Okay, well then, you know, that's the end of the official lecture. I guess we'll end up doing our last lecture on Thursday. And then the week after is the project proposals for the project presentation, so we'll do that. So yeah, so I think it's my office hours, so I will stay back and you know, let's thank Kathy once more and you know, 